Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday morning, very early, and it's still dark outside. And I have my organic coffee beans ground this morning, uh, and I French pressed my coffee. So grab yourself, put it on pause, and grab yourself a coffee um, uh, if you want to. As I stated in my last video several days ago, I started a personal uh, study through the sixth chapter of Isaiah. I love studying the Word of God on my own private time, as I hope all of you are daily, at least trying to daily. Um, but today is going to be verses 5 through 7. Uh, it's going to be part two of a three-part series through, the, through Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, but we're going to review quickly of what we did uh, several days ago in verses 1 through 4. In verses 1 through 4, uh, we saw the glory of the Lord, and the Lord and His scriptures through His Holy Spirit was clearly powerful, prophetic, and, what's the other word? Prolific. Um, we saw the throne, the seraphims, and we heard their cry. And we saw the earthquake as, as the prophet Isaiah had this vision of the seraphims. We saw the earthquake and the smoke. And again, the glory of the Lord. Can never emphasize, emphasis too, place too much emphasis on God's glory. Uh, now in part two, we will study the following. In part two, today, we're going to be studying verses five through seven. The vessel to honor. The vessel to honor. Which is prepared by a a confession, B, provision, and C, the remission of sins. But first, let me read verses 5 through 7. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. This is the word of God. Folks, this is, this is bigger than the Hollywood screen. Yeah, that's, a, that's almost... Shame on me for even comparing this to Hollywood, because Hollywood is sinful and weird. But in verse 5, Isaiah said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Before this divine theophanic encounter, Isaiah might have thought that he was somebody. Kind of like King Uzziah we talked about last week. Pride came along and caused uh, problems in Uzziah's uh, life. And perhaps Isaiah thought he was somebody. He might have thought that he was important. But once he had this close-up encounter with God's glory, he got humbled real quick. As it's been said, it is better to humble yourself, proactively, voluntarily humble yourself before God before, rather than wait for Him to have to humble yourself reactively against your will. Isaiah realized then, woe is me, because he is unworthy to stand before the worthy king in all of his glory. It's interesting that Isaiah's first words recorded in his book was, woe is me. This word woe in the Hebrew is a passionate cry of grief or despair. As one commentator said, and I quote, As sincere as his worship has always been, Isaiah has not been a man in love. His profession of faith has been orthodox but empty, with little heart awareness of the grandeur of God. Unlike the seraphim, Isaiah's lips are unclean. In fact, He's no better than anyone else, end of quote. I know and you know some professing Christians that are orthodox and empty. They have much knowledge but no zeal, and they have no love for the lost. They have no desire to do good works, and rightfully so. Some will even call them the frozen chosen. Head knowledge is very important. It says in the Scriptures, command scriptures, uh, Christians to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if that knowledge does not go through, manifest itself out through your heart and through the extensions of your hands 
and your feet, your body, and throughout the body of Christ, then your knowledge is futile. During the Q&A session at a conference, Charles Leiter said the following, and I quote, I remember a time years ago when I was around a group of guys who were all solid in doctrine and cold as can be. He then added, I remember writing in one of my notebooks, Oh God, put me with men of a burning heart, not cold, carnal doctrinarians, end of quote. Wow, that's, that's a pretty powerful plea to God. Put me with men that are on fire for the Lord with a burning heart, like this burning seraphim, not men of, that are cold, carnal doctrinarians. Isaiah goes on to say, For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. That's a good confession, my friends. This phrase, I am undone, in the Hebrew, means that Isaiah is realizing that he is dumb or silent, and that he has failed or that he will perish, that he has been cut down and destroyed. See, that's my goal when I preach the gospel out in the public, out in the streets, is to make people feel undone so that they may, may understand that they need salvation from their sins. Oh, Lord, I am undone. Save me from my sips. Clean my lips off. The word unclean here in the Hebrew means that Isaiah is foul. In a religious sense, he is defiled and polluted, that he is ethically and religiously impure and unclean. But he doesn't only judge himself here. Uh, when I preach in the streets, I often judge myself first and tell them I've broken God's law. I've lied. I've stolen. I've lusted or committed adultery by lusting. I've coveted, etc., etc. But so have you. We need to be saved. So what does Isaiah do in verse 5b? He says, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It's not just me. It's them too, Lord. We're all a messed up people. Today, the world and even some professing Christians will say, oh, that's judgmental. But understand this, Isaiah cares enough for those around him to confess their sins too, as he will soon be sent out to proclaim God's prolific, powerful, and prophetic message to them. And what happens next is amazing. Folks, this is, this is better than what you can see on the big, big screen, the big cinema, the big, the big uh, IMAX theater. This is much more powerful than that. And if you can't see how powerful and amazing this is, wow, you need some prayer, as we all do. Imagine seeing these seraphims in flight above you. I mean, I mean, I don't even know what sounds are in there, man, but they are flying above you. And all of a sudden, uh, one of the seraphims peels off from his own flight path, flying or descending right upon you, right in front of you. And there is this prolific, powerful, prophetic seraphim staring at you. Verses 6 through 7 said, Then flew one of the seraphims onto me, having a live coal in his hand, with which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched mine, thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. In verse 6, the seraphim utilized a pair of tongs to receive uh, or to retrieve a hot coal uh, from the altar. Yes, there was an altar, and he took the tongs, grabbed the coal from the altar, and took it to Isaiah. But take note, the seraphim didn't need to use these tongs. He didn't even need to use them. Because remember, back in verse 2, our last study, the Hebrew word for the seraphim was seraph, which means that he was a burning poison himself, that the seraphim was on fire. He was, he was burning. Uh, though this, seraph, this burning seraphim used tongs to pick up the red-hot burning coal, he then held the coal in his own hand. The coal had a holy significance. It belonged to a place of holy sacrifice, a place of atonement and forgiveness. This coal is a picture of Christ. This coal is a portrait of Christ on his altar, the cross, the old blood-stained tree. J. Alec Moitier said, quote, In the Old Testament, fire is not a cleansing agent, but is symbolic of the wrath of God, his unapproachable holiness, and the context of his holy law. 
The live coal which was brought to Isaiah was fire from the altar. The perpetual fire on the altar went beyond symbolizing divine wrath. For the altar was the place where the holy God accepted and was satisfied by blood sacrifice. It holds together the ideas of atonement, propitiation, and satisfaction required by God of the, and of the forgiveness, cleansing, and reconciliation, reconciliation needed by his people. All this is achieved through substitutionary sacrifice and brought to Isaiah, encapsulated in the single symbol of the live coal. End of quote. I love that quote. Folks, this is an amazing historical prophetic moment. In the transition between verse 6 and verse 7, the seraphim transfers this burning hot coal from the fire over to Isaiah's lips. This is a portrait of how God's wrath, which Isaiah was under and which I was once under, was placated by Christ. So much happened on and from that cross, then a death, burial, and resurrection. The, the, the gospel is beyond the mere death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And how dare any of us simply limit it to just that? Let me tell you this, this is, this is what happened on that cross, on that cross, including but not limited to the following. When Christ was nailed to that cross, that old blood-stained tree, God poured out his wrath and fury in exchange for punishing his elect, his church, as he, Christ, atoned for the sins of his church. At that point, Christ's propitiation, uh, the Greek word halosmos, fully appeased the wrath of God on behalf of his elect. Christ expiated sin and even removed the stain of sin. Christ reconciled the sinner to the Father. He declared me righteous before the Father. Christ placated God's divine wrath as he covers and remits sin as he annuls the power of sin. He didn't just cover and remit sin, he even annulled the power of sin in our lives. A lot of graceaholics will abuse their liberty, so-called freedoms in Christ, and they think they have freedom to sin, liberty to sin. No, my friends, Christ annulled the power of sin, therefore you now have the freedom from sin, uh, the liberty from sin, not the liberty to sin. Though we will still sin, God grants us repentance, and we will repent from our sin and thrust ourselves upon Christ. Oh, amen. This is another reason why I despise these unbiblical altar calls seen in today's uh, so-called churches and, 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 and crusades. Uh, they, not only do they rob God from his glory, they fraudulently impersonate the seraphim and a holy altar such as this. It is a counterfeit Christianity. The truth is, a biblical altar is a place where something is to be slayed and slaughtered. Let me say that again. A true altar, according to the scriptures, is a place where something is slayed and slaughtered. A biblical altar is a place of atonement. A biblical altar is a place of sacrifice. So don't walk forward to make a spectacle of yourself. You should walk forward to die. As Paul Washer, a wonderful missionary, as Paul Washer said, and I quote, now go out into the mission field and die, close quote. That's an altar, my friends. Matthew Henry said this, the live coal may denote the assurance given to the prophet of pardon and acceptance in his work through the atonement of Christ. Nothing is powerful to cleanse and comfort the soul, but what is taken from Christ's satisfaction and intercession, close quote. The seraphim placing this hot coal on Isaiah's lips is a beautiful picture of Christ. As Christ propitiates and expiates the sins of those that repent and trust in him. That's what it means to believe, to trust in Christ, to be entrusted and committed to Christ. G. Campbell Morgan said, old commentary I have, the pages are falling out. The vision of the Lord was full of grace and glory. The majesty of the Most High was manifest in the upper lifted and occupied throne. 
in the solemn chanting of the seraphim, and by the earthquake, which we saw last week, and by the earthquake, which made the very foundations of the thresholds tremble. The revelation of grace is, a remark is as remarkable as that of glory. In answer to the prophet's cry of need, one of the singing seraphims bears to him a live coal from the altar, and his sin is expiated. Has your sins been expiated? I sure hope so. I do not know the exact timeline of, of when Isaiah was saved. Um, I, I, some people believe that he was uh, saved before this event, before this passage. Uh, some people say, say that he believed that he was saved during this event. Regardless of your position of when he was saved, we can know for certain that this is when he was duly concentrated and appointed and anointed uh, as a great prophet to preach a specific message to a particular people. Matthew Poole said this, for Isaiah had been a prophet before this time and was now called, not in general to his prophetical office, but to deliver of this, but to the delivery of this special message. Close quote. All right, let's keep going while the coal is still hot. Verse 7. Isaiah said in verse 7, The seraphim laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged. Let's examine these three verb actions in this, path, in this verse. First, he laid it upon Isaiah's mouth. Second, his sins were taken away. And third, his sins were purged. Purged, gone. Justified, just as if he had never sinned. Notice that God did this. God did this, not man. It does not say that Isaiah... Uh, it does not say that Isaiah chose God, or that Isaiah accepted Jesus, or that Isaiah made a decision, or that Isaiah invited Jesus into his heart, or that Isaiah walked uh, before, uh, uh, walked up in front of a church, or that Isaiah did something. No, this was the monergistic work of the Lord. Isaiah, it was that God alone that touched Isaiah's lips through the hands of this prophetic seraphim in this vision. In other words, God did this. Those are three words that are powerful. God did this. We need to give all the glory to God. Isaiah's sins were not only taken away, they were purged. Kafar is the Hebrew word. Uh, they were covered, and it means that they were covered, expiated, placated, counseled out, cleansed, pardoned, forgiven, and purged away. As Isaiah was reconciled to the Father. That's what Christians are. Our, every Christian has a ministry. You know what that ministry is? We have different ministries, but all of us have one of the same, and that is the, the ministry of reconciliation, to uh, help people become reconciled or to tell them how they can become reconciled to the Father. And Isaiah was reconciled to the Father. And there are just some, these are just some of the simultaneous effects of salvation. We haven't even begun the lessons of repentance and sanctification. Regardless of whether you believe Isaiah was saved before or here, we can be certain of this. A salvific cleansing is a one-time incident, but a progressive cleansing for purposes of sanctification will follow salvation and will continue to go until you're in glory. F.C. Jennings said this, It is not at all necessary to look upon the prophet Isaiah here uh, as taking the place of an unforgiven sinner. Far from it. He was surely a saint long before this. It is not his regeneration that is here figured, but his being made meet for the master's use, in accord with the context that follows. Just as it is not an unregenerate sinner that we hear in Romans 7 crying, Woe is me, or wretched man that I am, but a saint learning a deeper lesson. Folks, you're either a saint or you're an ain't. Question is, are you always learning a deeper lesson? 
Regarding sanctification, here's a powerful passage on sanctification. Matter of fact, I probably should do an exegetical Bible study one day in the future just on this passage alone. And this is so important, my friends, to not just have the head knowledge, but to apply and demonstrate this throughout your life. Uh, Let your sanctification grow. And remember, in context, this is not talking just to Christians. This is a pastoral epistle, so he's also talking to leadership, to pastors and elders and those in Christian leadership. Uh, But Paul said, and before I read this passage, this reminds me of social media. This is why I have a rule on my Facebook page. Don't argue on my page. Stop your bickering and you're complaining and you're arguing and you're quarreling not only is it a bad witness before the lost world it actually can cause the person who posted the post to sin by causing them to grieve and quarrel and argue and and be in the flesh but paul said in second timothy 2 verses 20 through 26 but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Verse 22, listen to this command. Oh, this is legalism, is the the carnal Christian will say. Flee also youthful lust. Flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, Love, peace, and those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. Verse 26 and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Amen on that passage. That's a great one. We should do a, an expository teaching on that one day. Again, explanation, application, and demonstration of that passage is important. Here's a question that every pastor ought to ask their congregations at least one Sunday a month. How is your sanctification doing? How's your sanctification doing? Head knowledge is important, but unless you're being sanctified, Lord willing, Holy Spirit willing, and and, and demonstrating and applying sanctification in your life, it's all futile. Sadly, today I'm seeing a growing trend of professing Christians who do not believe uh, that it's our responsibility to disciple others and where sanctification and holiness no longer matters. The Bible commands the church to go and make disciples, But making disciples requires us to be pupils first, to be teachable. If we remain teachable, then we can disciple, instruct, and teach. But it's not just our responsibility only at the local church level. These opportunities will extend themselves via social media. So when we see a professing Christian act like the world or engage in fleshly things or do things on social media that perhaps might cause others to stumble or sin uh, before their online viewers, uh, when they do that publicly, that's yet another opportunity to warn the violator and, if necessary, even warn their online audience. But stand by to stand by. Be prepared. Because some of these professing Christians will try to silence you by referring to your correcting or contending as quote-unquote slander or gossip. You mean to tell me that every time the Apostle Paul named somebody by name in the New Testament that he was committing slander or gossip? I think not. So what do these professing Christians have in common with the reprobate mentioned in Romans chapter 1? They too will attempt to suppress the truth in their own unrighteousness. Well, my friends, this concludes this study. Lord willing, uh, we'll be doing part 3 next, which will be verses 8 through 13. Uh, I would encourage you, my friends, to to truly work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what Paul uh, told Timothy and the church. 
uh, once we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So thank you so much. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and share this with somebody as well. God bless you.